Like, let's play a game. I'll just name different people you see and see the slides that come into your head, right? Construction worker, sports fan, painter, skateboarder, lesbian. Right? It all goes blank. I, 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 is that a lesbian? I mean, I have gay friends, but I've never noticed any sort of a through line. Listen, people, I'm not saying all lesbians look alike. I would never say some ignorant shit like that. However, I am saying, though, every once in a while, there's a fucking layup. Flat top, wallet chain, fucking walking up the street. Right? But even then, even then, I'm not saying 100%. But gun to my head, I gotta go lesbian. Gotta go lesbian. But Good morning. It's Wednesday, Wasden Wednesday, October the 25th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the serenity prayer and the patriotic song of the day, we will have Bitcoin, Varney and Company, My Take, Rules for Retrogrades, Rules for Patriots, No Free Lunch, Rules for Radical Conservatives, Bishop Barron, Ayn Rand quote of the day, and SEAL Team 6. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I shouldn't change, the courage to change the things I should, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you. And now, no free lunch. There's uh, 250 Economic Truths by David Bonson. The groups that will be hurt the most are the low paid and the unskilled. The ones who remain employed will receive higher wage rates, but fewer will be employed. The loss to the unskilled workers will not be offset by gains to others. Smaller total employment will result in a smaller total output. Hence, the community as a whole will be worse off. Milton Friedman. Lesser employment at a higher wage does not magically create more output. The interest of the society economically is in total output. A higher wage for those retained in a government mandate of such does not facilitate higher productivity. And indeed, it is not even intended to do so. It sacrifices total output, the needs of the many, for a higher wage rate, the needs of the few, with no regard for the zero wage rate paid to the marginalized worker priced out of the equation. And that was There's No Free Lunch by David Bonson. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. And now, rules for radical conservatives. Inspired by a call from a Democratic senator and activist named Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin, where, like the syphilis virus, it went dormant for decades until it finally burst forth with what happy results we now enjoy. We are nothing if not incubators. Now, just between us, I like my Prius fine, but I have no more intention of giving up my other car, an Escalade, than I do of jumping off a bridge. Hardship and penury are for the little guy, not big-time screenwriters like me. But if you think back over the events of the past several decades or so, you will see how even the craziest notions that we introduce gradually get accepted, mostly by sheer dent of our repetition. So that what started as a clean-up-the-garbage day back in 1970 has gloriously turned into the carbon dioxide as a pollutant, transparent, but potent nonsense of our own time. Really, you have to give us some credit. What other movement could convince you that the very air you exhale is dangerous to the planet and will eventually charge you a tax for the privilege of not having to hold your breath until you turn blue and die? There, I said it. Die. The purpose of war is to kill your enemy. But after Kent State, when it was we who were getting killed, we had to stop fighting up front and out in the open, and instead begin a gradual process of getting you to kill yourselves. Now that's what I call a Cold War. Probably for the first time in history, one side pins its hopes of winning on the other's gullibility and willingness to believe even the most patently impossible things. Polar bears who can't swim. Melting ice caps. Seas rising. And that's simply global warming. The magnificent hoax with which we succeeded global cooling when that one didn't work out 30 years ago. But there's oh so much more. Your kids are all crazy. Give them drugs. Your cars are going to kill us all. Better to ride bicycles even in sub-zero weather. Right down the middle of the internal combustion engine propelled traffic we haven't managed to eliminate yet. Religion is the opiate of the masses. So go see a shrink. Cow farts are destroying the ionosphere, or whatever it is. Eat veggies. Criminals should be allowed to vote. Marriage is an outmoded, sexist, patriarchal institution. But let gays marry. And it's all your fault, so shut up and die already. It's like that scene in Goldfinger when Bond, James Bond, is lying there strapped to the table with a laser beam standing in for the usual buzzsaw, slowly sliding up his legs toward his crotch, and he asks the villain, You expect me to talk? To which Goldfinger replies, No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. There is nothing you can talk to me about that I don't already know. Or if it's a movie closer to our own time you're after, what about this exchange from Independence Day? You remember, the scene where the Area 51 alien has wrapped his tentacles around Brent Spiner's neck so he can communicate via the hapless scientist with the pitiful earthlings. The President... What is it that you want us to do? Alien. Die. Well, those two scenes pretty much sum up our attitude vis-a-vis -vis you. Now, you may object. Hey, holy cow, Dave, for crying out loud. If you make breathing illegal, then what hope do we have, huh? And now you've reached the central conundrum, which is why you're having such a hard time engaging us on the field of battle. And for this, I must reach for an unpleasant metaphor from the so-called War on Terror now blessedly over, to explain our position. Think of us as slow-motion suicide bombers. In the end, we understand that we will have to go too, certainly if we follow through on the logic of our positions, such as it is. But as proud atheists who see nothing beyond but darkness, we don't care. We don't care what happens in the long run. Because as John Maynard Keene said, in the long run, we're all dead. And he should know. Because A... He's the guy whose cockamamie economic nostrums basically wrecked the soundness of the American dollar when Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971. I try to tell my progressive friends that Nixon was the greatest friend we ever had, but they're still mad about the pink lady, Helen Gahagan Douglas. And B, he's dead. Meanwhile, we're damn well going to enjoy living in each and every moment while we're here. Being atheists, we are nothing if not in the moment. And failing that, at least make sure that your lives are as miserable as ours are. I don't want to bore you all with a lesson about, you know, ancient history 
that happened way before I was born, and about which I wouldn't care a fig were my family not so heavily invested in the outcome. But, given my marching orders from Che and his homies down there in Lansky land, to try and bring you up to speed, it's important that you get at least some of the deep background on the seminal events of our time. Much as we all would like to, we can't blame this fight on Clinton or Bush and the polarization of our politics that the chinwaggers like to wag about. You think we're polarized now? You should see the photographs of Che and Uncle Joe, blood streaming down their faces from the truncheon beatings they got, as for some reason now lost in the mists of history, they tried to prevent Hubert Humphrey from becoming president of the United States. I mean, you could practically pick an arbitrary starting point just about anywhere in American history to kick off the fisticuffs between left and right. And I realize those terms have changed meanings a lot over the past three centuries. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the Cold Civil War started during the Nixon administration and really is nothing new. The difference is that now it is no longer a battle between generations, but a civil war within a generation. Yes, the good old baby boomers. If their parents were the greatest generation, what can we say of our glorious boomer forebears? The worst generation slips trippingly off the tongue. The me generation got hung on them long ago. The narcissistic, irresponsible, arrogant, and entitled generation is a little long. So how about this? The viper generation. For sure, weren't they like vipers in the breasts of all those schlamatzels who came home from the war and promptly went about their duties to be fruitful and multiply the suburbs? And the thanks they got was the poisonous asps who lay in their cribs, played in their leafy yards, broke down the remaining social barriers that had previously kept their riffraff folks out of the Ivy League schools, and turned on their own kith and kin with a ferocity that hasn't been seen since Orestes whacked Clymenestra and her boyfriend. Although they obviously had it coming. Dedicated as we are to striking, destroying, poisoning, and destabilizing, we naturally flock to a party with a long criminal history such as the progressive Democrats had, as we shall see, and their admirably flexible and nuanced approach to such arcane notions as law and truth and morality, and standards of right and wrong. Well, you get the idea. As they ladled on the moral superiority, even as they violated every law and moral tenet in the enemy's book, well... Who wouldn't fall in love? It was like a permanent get-out-of-jail-free card, a form of atheist indulgence buying. But instead of sinning no more, we went out and sinned our tushes off. A party, a movement that promised us one thing above all, that it would never be judgmental, was just the thing some of us were looking for after those 18 dreadful years with mom and dad. In its warm, if slightly clammy embrace... We could indulge our every childish whim and fantasy, from our earliest erotic impulses to our inner four-year-old's appetite for destruction. All of those so-called rules went by the board as we realized that with the defeat of our parents' generation, there was now nothing and no one to stand in the way of our complete hedonistic orgy of self-fulfillment. Each vice now a virtue, each temptation an act of saving grace in the afterlife that we were sure would never come. Platoons, nay, brigades of shrinks and social scientists, novelists manque without any talent, otherwise they would be real scientists, arose to counsel us not to suppress our deepest id, but to let it have free reign in the real world, lest it damage us in the imaginary world in which they habitually dwelled. Up was suddenly down, black was suddenly white, in was suddenly out. How wonderful it all was. We never thought of the consequences, because consequences are for later, and we are for the here and now. It's no accident that one of our standard rejoinders, when you lot object to one or another of our social experiments that we've just implemented, usually by judicial fiat, is, well, the sky didn't fall, did it? This is such an easy softball to swat out of the park, one would have thought you would have long since figured it out. But no. Only one thing stood and continues to stand in our way. You. And by you, I mean principally the other half of the baby boomer cohort, the ones who didn't, like Satan, rebel. Some of them, a few, were like the angel Abdiel, who flirted with joining the insurgents but quickly repented and returned to the enemy camp. But most of them, kissing cousins to those murderous National Guardsmen at Kent State, were deaf to our siren song. 
and set about living their lives in much the same stultifying way as their fathers and grandmothers had. They got up in the morning and went to work, dealing with reality as if it was, you know, reality, instead of the elaborate artificial academic construct we had fashioned. Unlike us, the constant fetches, they never complained. They worked for ten cents on our dollar, their backs worth less than a penny for our thoughts. And still, the fools were under the impression they were living the American dream. Try as we might, and we did, to convince them otherwise, they believed in this country, believed in American exceptionalism, believed that their children would have a better life, believed, even when, like Abdio, they slipped and fell, in the power of redemption. And though we laughed at them, they persisted, which is one virtue we certainly know how to respect. So the cold civil war continues unto the generations which would be mine. Because unless you finish us, we are most certainly going to finish you. And that was Rules for Radical Conservatives by David Kahane. Back in a minute. Thank you, and now, Rules for Retrogrades, 40 Tactics to Defeat the Radical Left. Rule 4. Egalitarianism is evil. The retrograde must loudly announce that Christian teaching and nature are generally anti-egalitarian. This applies to both marital, sexual, and distributive, economic, relations Christianity formally rejects all types of utopianism, usually predicated on egalitarianism. In short, it is universal, even anti-natural, to expect, as today's popular culture does, a uniformity of roles and talents among human beings. Forced equality bears wicked fruits. As such, we should reject the notion of gender-neutral language, participation trophies, ties in ball games, and measures toward perfectly equal incomes among households. Instead, we should insist upon gender-specific grammar, trophies only for champions, tiebreakers in sports, and a meritocratic economy which guarantees to each his due. Only these are truly Christian and aligned with natural law. Radicals have recently changed the world by crying out, diversity, diversity, while simultaneously condemning all forms of non-egalitarianism. This is a bold contradiction, but it has heretofore gone unnoticed, or at least unannounced, by retrogrades. Truly healthy diversity is achieved by the widespread cultural acknowledgement of a talented natural aristoi as Thomas Jefferson noted, and its opposite, i.e., a less talented, average citizen. The retrograde announces the following economic fact of life. Certain sorts are more talented, bigger, faster, and better than others. Along similar lines, men and women comprise natural opposites. Egalitarianism is evil because it denies these basic truths of nature. Of course, two exceptional forms of modified equality do qualify as Christian. Equality of dignity and of opportunity. Exceptions in the Christian arenas of matrimony and political economy, respectively. 
First, let's examine equality in the realm of matrimony. Men and women are naturally, unalterably disparate. By now, radicals have used the slippery concept of equality to justify the near total destruction of matrimony. Sexual equality, even more than its economic sibling, proves to be a juggernaut engulfing everything it touches. The retrograde understands that men and women are not at all equals. Men are superior at being male as women are superior at being female. The Christian doctrine of complementarity involves equality in dignity between men and women, but not in function or power. As a term of art, dignity stands for the proposition that all human beings, every man and woman alike, enjoys rights in the eyes of God on account of their immortal souls. Yet dignity does not accrue from merit or usefulness. On the other hand, Sexual roles and talents have quite a lot to do with merit when we consider the functioning of the efficient household economy. Men were built to do some things and women to do others. Accordingly, even universal human rights, e.g. life or liberty, pertain and accrue to the two sexes differently. The manner in which men and women spend their rights should be expected to vary. In fact, men and women prove to be complementary precisely because of the natural disparity of function and power between them. A husband admires his wife's grace as she admires his efficacy. Footnote. The natural force that arises in that space of intersexual admiration may only be described as attraction, a beautiful phenomenon that cannot exist without male-female differences the natural law ensures that, on account of stark sexual differences of body and soul, men and women have indispensably different roles to play. Thus are they drawn to one another. Women are attracted to the strength, assertiveness, and activity of good men. Men are attracted to the fealty, gentleness, and receptivity of good women. Along those lines... Males attract females through leadership, just as females attract males through fealty. Natural complementarity dictates a beautiful fit between men and women. At least this was the case before radicals began attempting to pervert human sexuality in the popular mind. They did so by equalizing the sexes or claiming to have done so. End of footnote. Everything of a sexual nature after the 1960s grew monochromatic, uniform, and bland. Radicals violated their own claimed admiration of diversity, suggesting across all cultural venues that neither the male set of qualities, power, assertion, and activity, nor the female set, fealty, gentleness, and receptivity, turn out to be sex-specific. <clears throat> Through lies, force, and cajoling, Radicals convinced most people that culture, not nature, fabricated the sexual differences commonly observed prior to the sexual revolution. In other words, radicals popularized the lie that nature does not lay out gender roles. Sexual equality was their primary means of leveling the landscape. Women should become soldiers and pretend to like it. Men should become doddering wet nurses and pretend to like it. Like all utopian visions, sexual equality created an actual dystopia, a hell on earth. The retrograde seeks to undo this through truth, forceful reasoning, and cajoling. Retrogrades must reverse this sweeping cultural lie by showing the joy of the disparity between the two sexes, especially in the form of healthy marriages. Our mutual differences make men and women natural partners. They make us see and appreciate one another's strengths, which are not sex-fungible. Strangely enough, much of the retrograde's logic regarding the complementarian rapport between the two sexes applies with equal rigor to just economics in a less sexy way. 
In the economic case, the radicals attacked the merit which generates natural economic diversity. As Pope Leo XIII reminds his reader in warning against the new socialist reconfiguration of the mutual relationship between workers and their bosses, quote, each needs the other. Capital cannot do without labor, nor labor without capital, unquote. The great Pope goes on to specify the danger. To remedy these wrongs, the socialists working on the poor man's envy of the rich are striving to do away with private property and contend that individual possessions should become the common property of all to be administered by the state or by municipal bodies. They hold that by thus transferring property from private individuals to the community, the present mischievous state of things will be set to rights inasmuch as each citizen will then get his fair share of whatever there is to enjoy. Once more, egalitarianism is evil, Pope Leo XIII reminds us. On the contrary, he makes it clear that in a robust and just political economy with reasonably fair conditions, what you reap is what you sow. Pope Leo wrote one of the most important encyclicals of all time simply by channeling the basic anti-egalitarian attitudes of Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. According to Aristotle, fairness or distributive justice honors proportion, quote, for if persons are not equal, they ought not have equal shares, unquote. More specifically, fairness honors geometrical proportion, unequal shares for unequal merit. Conversely, equality haphazardly honors what Aristotle calls arithmetic proportion, equal shares for unequal merit. But Aristotle deems that such egalitarianism violates justice. Thomas Aquinas, for his part, agrees, writing, If property were equalized among the households, it would lead to a corruption of the polity. It also follows that the equalization of possessions is unsuitable from a consideration of the gradation of personages, as well as from human nature. There is a difference between citizens, just as there is between members of a body. The virtue and function of different members is different. The retrograde knows that in actuality there were two, not one, socialist errors of Russia warned against at Fatima in 1917, sexual egalitarianism and economic egalitarianism. The West has succumbed to both, although moderate right-wingers have usually picked one side or the other to spend energy in countering. Footnote. As shown clearly by the Malay at CUA debate on 9519 between David French and Sorab Ahmari, both types of non-retrograde conservative, post-liberals and classic liberals, have chosen to combat one, but not both types, of Russia's errors. End of footnote. Both egalitarian errors of Russia must be undone, however. Both must be decried and defeated in the West. Retrogrades have been appointed by the late hour to be the soldiers fighting to the death this two-front war. And that was Rules for Retrogrades, Rule 4, 40 Tactics to Defeat the Radical Left by Timothy and David Gordon. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. And now, Rules for Patriots by Steve Deese. Rodriguez was eventually replaced by Brady Hoke, who was a part of the Schembechler era. Hoke returned Michigan to its Schembechler era pillars, but moved forward at the same time. He's not running the same offense and defense Schembechler was running in 1969. He's not prickly with the media the way Schembechler was early in his career, but instead realizes the necessity of being professional and available with the media, telling your story to future recruits. He runs a contemporary program built on the foundations of a timeless tradition. In his first season in 2011, he went 11-2, and two, ended a seven-year losing streak to Ohio State, and notched Michigan's first major bowl victory in 12 years. Now that's what I call moving forward. The debate isn't about who is the next Reagan. The debate is about whether to move on or move forward from the Reagan era. Right now, the Republican Party on a national level is run by those who would rather move on. Sure, they use Reagan in their branding and fundraising, but they're far removed from the bold colors that he stood for. Their uniform is pale pastels. What I suggest we do is move forward. Reagan won two big arguments with the left. Low taxes that spur economic growth and peace through strength, focusing on the collapse of the Soviet Union via the arms race. Even Democrat presidents nowadays, when they're in trouble, offer targeted tax cuts and tax rebates as a means to spur economic development. So the debate is no longer about whether or not to cut taxes, but for whom and by how much. In addition, the era of the dovish Democrat president is over. President Clinton set a record for the most military deployments. President Obama may have talked a good George Soros game when running for president in 2008, but his foreign policy is virtually indistinguishable from his Republican predecessor, for better or for worse. And he's very proud to be the commander in chief that got Osama bin Laden. That's a far cry from the Democrats in the 1980s, fedding communist Sandinista leader Daniel Ortega at Beltway cocktail parties. However, Reagan failed to substantially reduce the size of government, did nothing substantive to dismantle the left's monopoly on education, lent his name to a failed amnesty program that turned California from red to blue in elections for the last two decades, and appointed two mediocre to terrible Supreme Court justices. We don't need to keep having arguments we've already won. We need to start winning arguments we haven't yet had. It's time to stop pining away for the salad days and move forward and build on Reagan's legacy, not settle for it. The Reagan era was supposed to be the vanguard of a conservative renaissance, and instead it's become the high watermark. Kobe Bryant and LeBron James were instantly compared to Michael Jordan coming into the NBA. Both of them initially did little to temper those comparisons, and early on they each languished under the sheer weight of them. It wasn't until they became their own men, James had to move to another team to make that happen, and they developed their own games that they became, both became, repeat champions. If we truly want to honor Reagan's legacy, we must stop drowning in nostalgia awaiting his heir apparent and instead rally around the principles he fought for. While we keep trying to turn the clock back, the left keeps moving forward. It's time for a new generation of leadership that combines a respect for tradition with a hatred for losing. And that means losing in the public policy arena and not just on election day. A new generation eager to prove themselves like Schembechler was when he arrived at Michigan in 1969, willing to get rid of the dead weight and not accept good is good enough when only greatness will do. It is time for leaders that aren't here to make friends with the system, but have a cause they believe is worth fighting and dying for if necessary. Leaders who don't create followers that become groupies or hangers-on or lifelong political hacks, but instead inspire others to become disciples and leaders themselves and move on and take the fight elsewhere when they're ready to do so. We've got too many people that are comfortable with losing not as bad and calling that a win. We need leaders from the Ricky Bobby Motivational School who understand second place is the first loser. And in our case, winning isn't simply winning an election, but winning the future for our children and grandchildren. We need a house cleaning and a culture change. We need to hit the control all delete buttons and reboot. You do that when your computer itself is still in good shape, but is locked up and not working the way it should. Similarly, our principles are still good. But the process of implementing them and advancing them has locked jaw. We have already discussed in this book how too often we accept the left's premise and allow them to have the moral high ground. So too often we end up being defined by what we're against, not what we're for. We also have failed to define what it is we're actually conserving as conservatives, which is an inherent weakness of our movement that 19th century theologian R.L. Dabney presciently observed. He said, quote, 
Conservatism's history has been that it demurs to each aggression of the Progressive Party and aims to save its credit by a respectable amount of growling. But it always acquiesces at last to the innovation. What was the resisted novelty of yesterday is today one of the accepted principles of conservatism. It is now conservative only in effecting to resist the next innovation, which will tomorrow be forced upon its timidity and will be succeeded by some third revolution to be denounced and then adopted in its turn. American conservatism is merely the shadow that follows radicalism as it moves forward through perdition. It remains behind it but never retards it and always advances near its leader. Every time I read that quote, it never fails to hit too close to home. As a Christian, I am commanded in the Bible to always have a ready defense for my faith, but nowhere am I commanded to remain perpetually on the defensive. The gospel itself is an offensive action, the result of a sovereign God who does not sit passively by like a kid with an anthill as his creation goes to pot, but instead actively engages his creation to the point of coming to earth himself to reach out to us flesh to flesh. The American Revolution was also an offensive action, with patriots taking action to preserve their God-given rights. I don't want to conserve the left's agenda by growing government less than they would, killing fewer children than they would, and destroying marriage incrementally through civil unions instead of outright handing over the institution of marriage like they would. I want to defeat the left, not conserve it. When it's time for my generation to leave the world stage, I want us to be known as the generation that did to America's leftist progressives what Reagan did to the Soviet Union. To make that happen, we need to play offense. Offense is essential because you have to be on offense to score points, and you have to score points to win. Playing offense also boosts your side's morale while doing psychological damage to the other side. Go back to the beginning of this chapter when I talked about how mentally beaten down we are. That's purely the result of the perception the left is always on the offensive and we're always on the defensive. That's why there's so much talk about returning to the Reagan era today, because other than the early days following the 1994 Republican takeover of Congress, that really was the only time any of us can remember our side on the offensive. I think that's also one of the reasons the late Andrew Breitbart made such an impact on the conservative movement, despite passing away at only 43 years old, which is an age when most men are just starting to come into their own. Breitbart played offense and went after the left and was equipping others to do the same. The left's confidence has morphed into hubris because they're used to playing offense and we've conditioned them to anticipate our surrender any minute now. That's why we need our people to play offense because it really does throw them into a hissy fit when we do. A good example of this was something Kentucky Senator Rand Paul did during the summer of 2012. Yes, that Rand Paul, the one who stepped in it earlier in this book. But this time he stepped on it, or rather, them. To do Rand justice, let's quote directly from the story the liberal Huffington Post did on the example I'm citing. Quote, Senator Rand Paul moved this week to hold a non-controversial flood insurance bill hostage until the Senate agrees that life begins at fertilization. The bill, which would financially boost the national flood insurance program on the cusp of hurricane season, had been expected to pass easily in the Senate. But since Paul on Monday offered an unrelated fetal personhood amendment, which would give legal protections to fetuses from the moment of fertilization, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid is threatening to halt progress on the legislation. I am told last night that one of our Republican senators wants to offer an amendment, listen to this one, wants to offer an amendment on when life begins, Reid said on the Senate floor Tuesday. I'm not going to put up with that on flood insurance. I can be condemned by outside sources. My friends can say, let them have a vote on it. There will not be a vote on that on flood insurance. We'll either do flood insurance with the amendments that deal with flood insurance or we won't do it. We'll have an extension. And uh, that was the next part of Chapter 13 of Rules for Patriots, How Conservatives Can Win Again. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. And now, Bishop Robert Barron. What else do we see in the cross of Jesus? Not just our sin. We see that sin swallowed up in the ever greater mercy of God. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus takes on all of it. Sin and cruelty, violence, hatred, injustice, all of it. Answers not in kind, answers not with the weapons of the world, but answers rather with God's forgiving love, which can take on all the sin of the world and swallow it up. That's also what we see when we gaze at the cross of Jesus. Our sin, yeah, and in itself, that's a very important move. But more to it, our sin conquered. And that was Bishop Robert Barron, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the Ayn Rand quote of the day. Quote, What you see around you today among modern intellectuals is the grotesque spectacle of such attributes as militant uncertainty, crusading cynicism, dogmatic agnosticism, boastful self-abasement, and self-righteous depravity. The two absolutes of today's non-absolutists are that ignorance consists of claiming knowledge and that immorality consists of pronouncing moral judgments, unquote. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now little Stuart Varney. East War. Gas unchanged, 354. Diesel unchanged, 451. All right, politics. Congressman Tom Emma knocked out of the speaker's race. Donald Trump didn't like him. Congressman Mike Johnson is the new candidate. He's a conservative Republican from Louisiana. The House reconvenes at 12 noon. Johnson is getting a lot of support. On the show today, what's the Republican Party going to do with Congressman Matt Gates? He's the guy who broke Kevin McCarthy's speakership, blew everything up, and came up with nothing. Wednesday, October 25th, 2023. Vanian. So um, again, he this is a guy that he's it's for profit media. He makes his money off of the the profits of Fox News, and Fox News gets their profits from uh, bad news, from the misery of other people. If there isn't a sufficient misery out there for them to um, get their profits, get their ratings, then they create it, and that's what he just did with Matt Getz. Uh, he could have, uh, if this was non-profit news, Matt Getz wouldn't be an issue. But because they've got to stir the pot, stir the pot, stir the pot, and get their ratings, get their profits, Matt Gates becomes an issue. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Stuart Barney's My Take. This is not the time to go wobbly. Margaret Thatcher used to say that when a colleague turned soft on her policies. President Biden will be sorely tempted to wobble over the war on Israel. He's rejected calls for a ceasefire, and that has really alienated the left wing of his party. There'll be demonstrations in cities across the country today. Hillary Clinton, she was heckled for not opposing Biden. And the squad, of course, will go all out in their support for Hamas. This is a difficult thing for the president because Hamas holds over 200 hostages, including some Americans. If Biden backtracks on crushing Hamas, the left looks powerful. The terrorists win and Israel loses. This is no time to go wobbly on terror. Same with Iran. Confront. Don't appease. We're learning today that American soldiers were injured in recent drone attacks orchestrated by Iran's proxies. The mullahs are attacking us. What's the response? Secretary of State Blinken uh, threatens Iran with a decisive response. Any backing away from that would be taken as another sign of Biden's weakness. That's at the heart of all this, isn't it? Our president is seen as weak. We can't go back and reset that. Now we must advance, go forward, take the action to those who challenge us. Anything less encourages our enemies. 
He's under great pressure from his own party to wobble, to retreat on Gaza and Hamas, on Iran and the mullahs. At 12.30 Eastern, we'll find out where he's headed. He takes questions from the media. First time he's done that since the war on Israel began. Second hour of Arnie, just getting started. And so says the uh, greedy, bloodthirsty Stuart Varney, the bloody tourist. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now a, a little bit of uh, squawk box. And what Washington decides does matter. And I would think that having them decide something would be helpful. Like just getting rules of the road would probably. So I think that uh, the companies that deal with Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, they care what Washington is doing, right? They're the ones who are spending the money. They're, they're the ones who are doing this. Bitcoin is a decentralized protocol. Bitcoin's not spending any money. Bitcoin doesn't even have a team behind it. And so I think that the companies very much care and they are lobbying and they are trying to get these uh, clarity of rules and try to you know push this forward. But Bitcoin itself, if the government tomorrow came out and banned Bitcoin, mm-hmm. everyone else around the world would say, okay, and they probably would actually go buy it because all of a sudden they would say, hey, this is outside the system. This is something that isn't controlled by any government. It isn't controlled by any individual. And so it's this very interesting thing where decentralization of the protocol really matters, but the companies, they're still centralized companies with American citizens running them, and they definitely care what is going on in Washington. So uh, what's interesting here is Bitcoin is nothing. It's a zero. Um, But the way that the left always works, and this this is with everything that they do, is they take, simply take an idea, which is nothing more than a potential, and in order to make it real, what they do is they talk about it as if it were real. It's called act as if. Uh, Hillary Clinton used to call it fake it till you make it. And so that's what he's doing here. He's talking about Bitcoin as though it's actually something real. And the idea is then to get everybody else uh, sucked in so we're all talking about bitcoin as though it's real and that that's the strategy to actually realize the potential <clears throat> excuse me of this zero and this is the way they do with everything that you just talk about it as though it's a real thing talk about it as though it's established talk about it as though it has power and etc and the belief is that if enough people get on board then it becomes irresistible you can't um, you can't defeat hundreds of thousands or millions of people's attitudes or opinions. So, but uh, it's, Bitcoin is still nothing. It's still a zero. As he said, it's a protocol. What does that mean? No answer. Oh, it's a, a store of value. Well, where's the store of value? No answer. Uh, oh, no, it's a blockchain. Okay, well, where's the blockchain? No answer. It's nothing. But again, they're going to keep talking about it every day on Squawk Box and on um, the um, on Fox, on Varney and Company and Maria Bartiromo. They list Bitcoin and how much Bitcoin is worth, not not on its own, but measured in dollars. Because without dollars, Bitcoin would be what nothing, and it is nothing. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now some more of SEAL Team 6 by Howard Wasden. Later, Sigint heard chatter from the bar around the corner that ID's people might gather. 
Maybe they were planning to do a hit on us. Pasha went to full alert. We staged AT-4 anti-tank rockets and took up perimeter positions. It turned out Idid's people were only having a recruiting rally. An asset cited Idid but couldn't pinpoint his building. This was our logistical nightmare. Even though our assets had spotted Idid, they couldn't relay to us his exact building. A SIGINT aircraft, having flown in from Europe and now dedicated to us, arrived in the evening to help track and pinpoint Idid. This tremendously increased our surveillance abilities. We could use transmitters and beacons more effectively. It also made us able to intercept communications better than from the rooftop of our building. In the big house next to Pasha on the right was the Italian ambassador's residence, where the ambassador threw a big party with many Italian officers in attendance. Italy had occupied Somalia from 1927 to 1941. In 1949, the UN gave Italy trusteeship of parts of Somalia. Then in 1960, Somalia became independent. Now the Italians were real bastards, playing both sides of the fence. Whenever the Black Hawks spun up for an operation, the Italians flashed their lights to let the locals know the Americans were coming. Their soldiers employed electric shock on a Somali prisoner's testicles, used the muzzle of a flare gun to rape a woman, and took pictures of their deeds. The UN accused the Italians of paying bribes to Idid and demanded that Italy's General Bruno Loi be replaced. The Italian government told the UN to stop harassing Idid. One of Italy's main players was Giancarlo Marocino who left Italy following allegations of tax evasion and married a Somali woman in one of Idid's clans. When the UN confiscated weapons from the militia, the Italian military gave them to Giancarlo, who is suspected to have sold them to Idid. Italy dumped trillions of lira into Somalia for aid. With help from people like Idid, even before he became an infamous warlord, Most of the money went into the pockets of Italy's government officials and their cronies. The Italians constructed a highway that connected Bosasso and Mogadishu, from which Giancarlo Marocino in the trucking business is reputed to have received kickbacks. Marocino also cultivated a close relationship with news correspondents by whining and dining them during their stay in Mogadishu. Also living in our neighborhood and playing both sides of the fence was a Russian military veteran with some intelligence background, now a mercenary operating out of a building two houses down from Pasha. He would work for either side, as long as they paid. We suspected he helped both sides with finding safe houses and recruiting. He and the Italians seemed to be working together. The Sicilian family that taught me how to cook loved America. In contrast... The behavior of the Italians in Somalia came as a huge punch in my gut. We received a report that Idid might have acquired portable infrared homing surface-to-air missiles, Stinger missiles, which can be used by someone on the ground to shoot down aircraft. Casanova, the SIGINT medic, and I did another hard entry on the house of the boy with wounded legs. The family wasn't as scared the second time, but they weren't relaxed either. A hard entry is a hard entry. We cuffed them again, then held security as we tended to the boy. He looked a lot better and didn't need to scream or pass out as we cleaned him up. September 3rd, 1993. The following morning, we prepared for a trip to the army compound. Our Somali guards did in advance, making a recon of the route before we headed out. During the actual trip, the guards used a decoy that split from us to a different route. Anyone trying to follow would have had to split their forces to follow both vehicles or flip a coin and hope they followed the correct vehicle. Although I received formal training for such tactics, our guards figured this out on their own. Their experiences fighting in the Civil War taught them to adapt out of necessity. They were highly intelligent. The inside of the Army compound was fortified with sniper hides, guard towers, and fighting positions. We picked up some infrared chem lights and fireflies in preparation for upgrading Pasha's perimeter security. While there, we also held a meeting with Delta, telling them about the mortar attack details and suspected firing points. They climbed up onto the roof of the hangar and did a recon by fire. Snipers shot into suspected areas of mortars and hoped our SIGINT would pick up communication of near hits, verifying locations. 
When General Garrison found out, he whacked our peepees. He didn't like the recon by fire action. That night back at Pasha, in order to help our guards have a better understanding of what we were doing and how we were doing it, Casanova attached an infrared chem light to himself and walked around the perimeter of the house. To the naked eye, the chem light was invisible. I let the other guards look through our KN-250 night vision scopes so they could see the glowing light on Casanova. The guards gasped, their faces looking like they'd just seen their first UFO land. They lowered the scopes and looked with their naked eyes. Then they looked through the scopes at Casanova again. Their speech became rapid and their bodies animated, as if they were now riding on the UFO that had just landed. Casanova and I chuckled at their reaction. Later in the evening, we went with Stingray, working under Condor, to do a dog and pony show with the chem lights and other gear for the chief of police, one of our major assets and responsible for recruiting a number of others, giving him a taste of how we operated. As a result, the chief of police felt more secure about putting his people at risk working for us. $50,000 made him financially secure. Maybe he only used $1,000 of that to pay his 20 or 30 assets and pocketed the rest of the money. Casanova and I hit the house of the wounded teenager again. Mom and Dad obediently took their positions on the floor next to the wall before we put them there. The aunt went down on a knee and held up a tray of tea for us. I took a drink and offered the family some. They refused. We had brought our interpreter with us this time to direct the family as to the boy's care. The family had gone to great lengths to get the tea, and it was all they had. It was the only way they knew to say thank you. They'd been using a witch doctor, but he obviously hadn't been much help in curing the boy. By now, the stink of the boy's wounds had almost gone. Some of his fever remained. Still, we did another surgical scrub. We gave the family some amoxicillin, an antibiotic for infections. Give this to the boy three times a day for the next ten days. I noticed his gums were bleeding. The inside of his mouth was a bloody mess. He's got scurvy, our medic said. Scurvy is caused by vitamin C deficiency. Sailors of old used to get this disease before Scottish surgeon James Lind of the British Royal Navy figured out that sailors who ate citrus fruits had fewer problems with scurvy. With limes readily available from British Caribbean colonies, the Royal Navy supplied men with lime juice. This is how British sailors got the nickname Limey. September 4th, 1993. Casanova and I went out for a drive to recon alternate E&E routes, find out about mortar attack locations, and get a better feel for the area. Later, an asset told us that two mines had been placed on a road and were to be detonated on American vehicles, the same road I'd traveled the day before to meet with Delta at the Army compound. They must have found out about our trip and just missed us. In our neighborhood, little girls walked a mile a day just to get drinking water and carry it back home. A four-year-old washed her two-year-old sister in the front courtyard by pouring water over the top of her. Most Americans don't realize how blessed we are. We need to be more thankful. By this time, we had become celebrities, controlling a two- to three-block area. When Casanova saw school kids, he'd flex and kiss his huge biceps. They imitated him. A small group of kids would gather, and we'd hand out parts of our MREs. Candy, chocolate cookies, Tootsie Rolls, and Charms chewing gum. Yes, we gave up our cover. But Condor thought this was good for winning the hearts and minds of the locals. I agreed. I took a bag of oranges to the crippled boy next door, but he couldn't eat because the citric acid stung his bleeding gums. Casanova held his body down while I put him in a headlock and squirted the liquid into his mouth. After two or three more visits, the oranges didn't sting. Eventually, the scurvy would go away. To help the boy... Condor told the CIA that the boy was related to one of our assets, even though he wasn't. We had an asset take him some crutches, and I requested a wheelchair. Later, the boy next door stayed on the porch to spot us when we made our rounds up on the roof of Pasha. He gave us a wave and a smile. It was my most successful op in Somalia. 
and I had to disobey direct orders to get it done. Better to ask forgiveness than permission. Adid ran his own Hearts and Minds campaign. He made public announcements against Americans and started recruiting in our area. Anyone, from children to the elderly. Our assets informed us of a trail to be used to supply Adid with Stinger missiles. Afghanistan to Sudan to Ethiopia to Somalia. The missiles were leftovers from those that the United States gave Afghanistan to fight the Russians. Years later, the United States offered to buy the Stingers back. $100,000 for each one returned with no questions asked. Idid received help from Al-Qaeda and the PLO. Al-Qaeda had snuck in advisors from Sudan. Not too many people knew about Al-Qaeda then. But they supplied Idid with weapons and trained his militia in urban warfare tactics like setting up burning barricades and fighting street to street. If Idid didn't have the stingers yet, they'd be arriving soon. In the meantime, Al-Qaeda taught Idid's militia to change the detonators on their RPGs from impact detonators to timed detonators. Rather than having to make a direct hit on a helicopter, the RPG could detonate near the tail rotor the helo's Achilles heel. Firing an RPG from a rooftop invited death by backblast or the helicopter guns, so Al-Qaeda taught Idid's men to dig a deep hole in the street. A militiaman could lie down while the back of the RPG-2 blasted harmlessly into the hole. They also camouflaged themselves so the helos couldn't spot them. Although I didn't know it at the time, the Al-Qaeda advisors in Somalia probably included Osama bin Laden's military chief, Mohammed Atef. Similarly, the PLO helped Idid with advice and supplies. Now Idid wanted to hit high-profile American targets. Our SIGINT intercepted communication about a plot to launch a mortar attack on the American embassy. Furthermore, assets informed us that the Italians continued to allow Idid's armed militia to cross U.N. military checkpoints responsible for safeguarding the city. His militia merely had to find out where the Italians had their checkpoints in order to move freely, right into the backyard of the United States and everyone else. Two of Idid's bodyguards wanted to give up their master's location for the $25,000 reward. Leopard wanted to meet them at Pasha. To get to Pasha... Leopard planned to travel through the Italian checkpoint near an old pasta factory, Checkpoint Pasta. However, Leopard didn't know that the Italians had secretly turned Checkpoint Pasta over to the Nigerians. Minutes after the turnover, Idid's militia ambushed and killed the seven Nigerians. That evening, I heard a firefight close to Pasha, and the closest mortar yet. Obviously, the bad guys had started to figure out what was going on and where. Our days at Pasha were numbered. September 5th, 1993. Sunday morning before 0800, Leopard and four bodyguards rode two Isuzu troopers out of the UN compound. When the vehicles reached Checkpoint Pasta, a crowd swarmed around them. A couple of hundred yards ahead, burning tires and concrete blocked the road. Leopard's driver floored the accelerator, crashing through the ambush. Forty-nine bullets struck their vehicle. One shot passed through a space in Leopard's flak jacket, striking him in the neck. The driver raced them out of the ambush and helped Leopard to a hospital in the UN compound. After 25 pints of blood and 100 stitches, General Garrison flew Leopard to a hospital in Germany. Leopard survived. Later that day, I heard 50 caliber shots the kind that can penetrate bricks, fired in the northwest 300 to 500 yards from our location. With shooting nearby and a recent ambush, we knew our ticket was about to get punched. On full alert now, we took up battle stations. I called in an AC-130 Spectre to fly overhead in case we needed help. Capable of spending long periods of time in the air, the Air Force plane carried two 20-millimeter M61 Vulcan cannons, one 40mm L-60 Bofors cannon, and one 105mm M-102 howitzer. Sophisticated sensors and radar helped it detect enemy on the ground. You could let loose a rabbit on a soccer field, and the AC-130 Spectre would make rabbit stew. I had trained in Florida at Hurlbird Field on the plane's capabilities, 
and how to call for its fire to rain down on the enemy. It aroused me to know we were getting ready to light up some of Idid's people. Instead, fortune smiled on them as they chose to fight another day. That same day, we found out that one of our primary assets had been made, so we had to fly him out of the country. At 2000, an asset told us that Idid was at his aunt's house. Condor called in a helo to fly Stingray and the asset to the army base and brief General Garrison. All of us in Pasha were ecstatic. Everything we had done at Pasha, running the assets, SIG, it, everything, had led to this moment. We had good intel and the cloak of darkness to protect our assault team. The asset even had a diagram for the house, ideal for special operators doing room entries. I deed was ours. The request was denied. I still don't know why. Condor and Stingray were outraged. We will not get another chance this good. The rest of us couldn't believe it either. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot? In the military phonetic alphabet, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot is WTF. What the blank? I was angry that we had worked so hard for such an important mission only to be ignored. It seemed that military politics were to blame. I also felt embarrassed at how my own military had treated the CIA. Condor, I'm really sorry. I don't know what the hell. I don't know why we didn't do this. Condor wasn't mad at us, SEALs, but he was mad at General Garrison. If Garrison isn't going to do it, why did he even send us out here? Why do all this work, spend all this money, put ourselves at risk, put our assets at risk, if we aren't going to pull the trigger? I finished his sentence. We had ID'd. You're damn right we had him. At the time, I was mad at Garrison, too. Delta launched on the dry hole at the Lig Legato house, but they couldn't launch when we really had ID'd. It wasn't going to do any good to punch anything or yell at anybody. When I become ultra-furious, I become ultra-quiet. After Condor and I shared our misery, I went mute. The others let me have my space. We all mourned the loss of that mission. September 6th, 1993. At 0400 on the roof of Pasha, Casanova and I heard a tank make a wide circle. We didn't even know I deed had a tank. We readied our AT-4s. Hours later, Casanova and I told Little Big Man and Sourpuss. There can't be a tank here, Sourpuss argued. We'd have seen a tank by now. We know what we heard, I said. I'm not impressed, Sourpuss said. You might impress the CIA with your nonsense, but I'm not impressed. Whatever. That same morning, one of our assets was shot stepping out of his vehicle. Before long, a second asset, our maid's brother, was killed, shot in the head. He was one of the good guys. He wasn't in it for the money as much as he was in it to help his clan end the Civil War. She couldn't hide the sadness in her eyes. As if things weren't bad enough for us, a third asset was beaten almost to death by the Italians. A report came in that Idid possessed anti-aircraft guns. Idid continued to grow stronger and more sophisticated thanks to help from Al-Qaeda, the PLO, and the Italians turning a blind eye. The locals recognized the growth too and were encouraged to join Idid. Delta had intelligence that Idid was in the old Russian compound. So Delta went after him and took 17 prisoners. But no Idid. Only two of the 17 were considered to be of interest. They were detained, interrogated, and then freed. Delta had given Idid's people another exhibition of how they operate. Fly in, fast rope down, and use a Humvee blocking force of rangers to protect the operators as they take down the house. This would come back to bite us in the ass. September 7th, 1993. One of our primary assets, Abe, called in four hours late. We feared him dead. Finally, he showed. I do tonight's mission. Sorry, you've already been scratched. Scratched? Mission canceled. No mission for you tonight. In the evening,
evening, Casanova and I escorted Condor to deliver $50,000 to an asset. The high-level assets were wealthy and influential and had a number of people working under them. Condor went to the high-level assets rather than making them come to him, checking the number of new recruits, collecting their pictures, finding out how they would divvy up the money with their own assets, briefing them about procedures. The whole meeting took about an hour and a half. While Casanova and I stood guard outside, we heard a firefight approximately 200 yards north. Little Big Man and Sourpuss saw the tracers from the firefight in our direction. You guys need assistance? They radioed us. No, we weren't involved. If we fired a green flare, Little Big Man and Sourpuss would call in a helo extract, then fight their way to our position to assist until the helo arrived. Later that night, back at Pasha, I got my second confirmed rat kill. September 8th, 1993. The Rangers reported that they spotted an old Russian tank a couple miles out of town and destroyed it. I reminded Sourpuss about the tank Casanova and I had heard several nights earlier. See? It's called a tank. You know, they make a certain sound while moving. Sourpuss walked away. That day, Abe became our main asset. We gave him an infrared strobe light and a beacon with a magnet attached. He seemed confident he could get close to ID'd, so we put Delta on alert. ID'd is moving, Abe called. As the night grew old, Abe couldn't pinpoint ID'd's position. Although no communication traffic reached SIGINT, several large explosions came from the direction of the airport. ID'd's mortar crews had figured out how to communicate their fire and control without being intercepted by us. Damn, they are resilient. September 9th, 1993. General Garrison received permission to go to Phase 3, going after ID's lieutenants. Delta flew over Mogadishu as a show of force with the entire package. 10 to 12 Little Birds and 20 to 30 Blackhawks. Delta snipers rode in the light Little Bird helicopters, which could carry guns, rockets, and missiles. In the medium-sized Black Hawk helicopters, also armed with guns, rockets, and missiles, the Delta entry teams and Rangers had fast ropes ready in the doorway to make an assault at any moment. The idea was to show ID that ours was bigger than his, making him less attractive to the local population and, hopefully, hurting his ability to recruit. On the same day, near the pasta factory two kilometers away from the Pakistani stadium, the Army's 362nd engineers worked to clear a Mogadishu roadway. A Pakistani armored platoon protected them while the Quick Reaction Force, QRF, stood by in case they needed emergency reinforcements. The QRF was made up of men from the conventional Army's 10th Mountain Division, 101st Aviation Regiment, and 25th Aviation Regiment their base located at the abandoned university and old American embassy. The engineers bulldozed an obstacle from the road when a crowd of Somalis gathered. One Somali fired a shot, then sped away in a white truck. The engineers cleared a second obstacle, then the third, burning tires, scrap metal, and a trailer. Someone on a second-story balcony fired at them. Engineers and Pakistanis returned fire. The enemy fire increased, coming at them from multiple directions. The crowd moved obstacles to block the soldiers in. The engineers called in the QRF helos. In three minutes, armed OH-58 Kiowa and AH-1 Cobra helicopters arrived. Hundreds of armed Somalis moved in from the north and south. Enemy RPGs came in from multiple directions. The Cobra opened up on the enemy with 20mm cannons and 2.75-inch rockets. More QRF helos were called in for help while the engineers tried to escape, heading for the Pakistani stadium. IDEED's militia fired a 106mm recoilless rifle, blasting the lead Pakistani tank into flames. A bulldozer stopped dead, so the engineers abandoned it. As 30 Somalis tried to take the abandoned bulldozer, two tow missiles destroyed them and the bulldozer. The engineers, two wounded, and the Pakistanis, three wounded, fought on until they reached the stadium. One Pakistani died. It had been the largest battle in Somalia to that point. 
Our intelligence sources told us that Idid had commanded the ambush from the nearby cigarette factory. More than 100 Somalis died and hundreds more were wounded, but Idid had succeeded in keeping the road closed, restricting the UN forces' movement. In addition, the media assisted Idid by reporting the many innocent Somali deaths. I hate our liberal media. Must be easy to sit back and point fingers when you're not involved. President Clinton also helped Idid halting combat operations in Mogadishu until an investigation could be completed. Political popularity trumps American lives. Idid launched artillery over Pasha. Machine gun fire and firefights reached closer to us. We remained on full alert and high pucker factor. Idid's militia also launched mortars on the Nigerian checkpoint at the port of Mogadishu, turned over by the Italians. Condor's assets infiltrated a rally held in a vehicle repair garage where I.D. tried to pump up his troops. If I.D. was actually there at the rally, we wanted to know. He wasn't. September 10th, 1993. At 0500 the next day, I.D.'s militia fired more artillery at the port of Mogadishu checkpoint. That same day, an asset told us that I.D.'s people knew about Pasha. They described our guns and vehicles, and they knew Condor from before we set up Pasha. Idid ambushed CNN's Somali crew. Their interpreter and four guards were killed. Idid's militia had mistaken the CNN's crew for us. We also found out that an Italian journalist had arranged to do an interview with Idid. One of our assets put a beacon on the journalist's car so we could track him. The journalist must have suspected something was wrong because he went to the house of one of the good guys instead, probably hoping we'd launch an attack there. Fortunately, we had an asset on the ground verifying the location. Even so, the CIA was screwed. So were we. We had good intel that IDEED's people were going to ambush us. Instead of two SEALs on watch and two resting, we went to three SEALs on watch and one resting. September 11th, 1993. I finally got to bed at 0700 the next morning. No ambush. Saropus woke me up at 1100 to tell me that our assets were reporting that IDEED's militia was closing in on us. Another asset told us that the bad guys had targeted our head guard, Abdi, because they knew he was working for the CIA. One of the guards in his employ was his own son. The head guard took responsibility for paying the guards. Moreover, he had responsibility for their lives. He held an important status in his clan. The head guard put his family and clan at risk to help the CIA. Part of his motivation was money, but the greater motivation seemed to be a better future for his family. Now, he was made. Later, we would find out who ratted him out. The Italians. Condor called General Garrison. We've been compromised, and we need to get the F out of here. At 1500, leaving non-essential equipment such as MREs, everyone in Pasha packed up, and we drove to the Pakistani stadium. Helicopters extracted us at 1935, taking us back to the hangar on the military compound. In retrospect, on the first day at Pasha, we should have flexicuffed the Italians and taken them out of the area, and we should have assassinated the Russian mercenary. Then we would have had a better chance of running our safe house and capturing Idid. Of course, it would have helped if our own military had let us capture Idid when we had him at his aunt's house. Although we had lost Pasha, we still had targets to act on. And that was uh, CIA safe house hunting for Idid from SEAL Team 6 by Howard Wasden. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States. Today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there and reminding you to be honest, smart, and beautiful, and remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.